Welcome back to the Philosophy of Fitness podcast, episode 87. Today, I am joined with Sabrina Zohar. I stumbled across Sabrina on TikTok and love your no BS approach to dating advice. I think you tell things straight, just how they should be told, uh, which is really refreshing to find. So Sabrina, I'm so excited to have you on today. Thank you so much for having me. I'm stoked to be able to be welcomed into the community. Yeah, for sure. I think a lot of people at least for me, I'll, I'll speak about my experience. I'm someone who kind of struggles with the more anxious attachment style. Uh, and I know attachment styles is something that you talk about a lot and we can totally get into. But what I want to talk about today is, you know, approaching dating from that lens of having struggled with anxious attachment. And there's a lot of things that I want to dive into. I was scrolling through your TikTok before this and so many little nuggets of wisdom that you were just dropping truth bomb after truth bomb. <laughs> Uh, but before we get into it, I'm really curious for you personally, because it seems like you found a place now where you're helping other people with their dating lives. Did you identify as an avoidant or more on the anxious side? What was that journey like for you? Yeah, totally. I So I came from very cliche, abandonment issues as a child. My dad was always in and out. And it's funny because it manifested itself so differently between my siblings and I. Like my brother's very avoidant and I was textbook anxious. And honestly, I didn't, I didn't understand it. So I lived in New York for 12 years of my adult life, like from 18 or 19 to, I had moved a couple of years ago. Um, and for years, I just, I just kept thinking like, what's wrong with me? There's something wrong with me. I'm so alone. Why does every relationship not work? And like, when I say I had to text, it would be like blue dot, blue dot, blue dot, blue dot, blue dot, with me just incessant. And like if I didn't get that text in the morning, I would fucking lose my shit. My mood was dependent. I remember even my sister once being like, oh, she, she saw me smile. She goes, let me guess, he reached out to you. And I was like, wow. Even like my sister called me out on it. And she was like, here we go. Now you're fine, right? And I was like, fuck. Oh. But I didn't understand. And I, my ex was my father. I was as textbook and cliche as that. I married the most narcissistic, abusive fucking person. He ripped me down. But at that time, I read attached. And I was like, oh, he's avoidant and I'm anxious. That's what started the awareness for me of like, oh, okay, I kind of get this. But then I was the shell of a human. I was like, I'm 5'8". I was 107 pounds when I was with him. And I'm now 140 pounds. Like, wow. as a, yeah. Like, to show you, I had no friends. I was completely alienated. I was super depressed. I was in the worst space. And then we broke up. And he stayed in my home for three months. And that's when I started therapy. I was like, I can't keep doing this. I was in therapy while we were together, but it didn't seem to really work. And then when I started doing the inner child stuff and really diving, diving deep, that was the journey of like, holy fuck, this is where I am. Okay, I'm anxious. And then here's how to heal it. And I figured out all the modalities. And that's where I come from. That's why I think I resonate with so many people in the anxious community is because I can say, I know exactly what your thought process is. And they're like, oh my God, you get me. I'm like, yeah, because I was you. Yeah. I so relate to what you said about... Um... The texting, like the, like when someone can tell, oh, you got a text from them. Like for me, it would be like, if I didn't hear from them for four or five hours, pit in my stomach, yeah. so anxious, couldn't even eat. And I'm sure you yeah. can agree too. Like, I remember there was someone I was dating a few years ago. And if I didn't hear from him for like four or five hours, my day was ruined. I could not yeah. focus on anything else. Couldn't do my job right. Couldn't think about anything else. And a lot of people don't realize, the people that are on the avoidance side don't realize how much that anxious attachment style can eat you alive. It is all consuming because it, it's almost like you're putting that person on a pedestal and your your whole world revolves around them. Right. And then so it's like, and on that same token, it's like, because I don't, and I'm, I'm with you 100%, like I don't think that there's an awareness, but I would say even on the anxious to the avoidance side, like there's a big awareness that's missing on both sides because it's, an, it, when you think about it, it's like one pulls away, one goes closer. There's no one that's better. There's no one that's worse. It's just how you internalize it. I know a lot of avoidance, it will eat them up inside and they are completely in turmoil, but they just retreat back versus it being outwards. And the avoidance, the reason I think it's gotten this wreck of like not as bad is because they express themselves. They open up, but it's, there's no right or wrong. They're equally from an insecure place. They both stem from deep insecurity and abandonment and fear of rejection. It just manifested itself differently. My brother and I had the same two parents, but he was painfully avoidant and I was painfully anxious. Manifested itself differently. Yeah, it is interesting how that happens too because I even think about my brother and mm -hmm. he's on the opposite side of the spectrum too. He's a lot more avoidant and I'm more on that anxious side, but we had the same upbringing, but it all depends on how how you respond to that environment. And it's interesting to see how it, it really does trickle into every area of your life. But I think a lot of people overlook just 
taking time to sit with yourself and understand how you were during childhood because so many of our tendencies, even outside of relationships, can be traced back to childhood, you know? 100%. Almost every client I've had up to this point, not even exaggerating, the minute they're like, oh, I've done a lot of therapy and I understand, like, why am I not feeling better? The minute I'm like, let's talk about your childhood. They're like, what? Because even attachment styles, it's not still relatively new, like dismissive yeah. and fearful. It's like, these are, I mean, the book Attached was written in 2010. So we're talking 13 years of being mainstream. And then that all these new dismissive and fearful that people weren't really familiar with prior that are now starting to come to the forefront. And it's like, that's why there's a big, that's why a lot of therapists don't talk about that stuff. Because when I ask my clients, I'm like, what do you, you know, you don't talk to your therapist about inner child work because it's not as, it, it's a newer thing. And but it doesn't mean that there's not validity to it and there's not a ton of research and data to show how it helps. It's just taking a minute to catch on. Yeah, it definitely is. And I think too, generationally, at least in my experience of older people that I've spoken to, that kind of stuff was never talked about at home. Yeah. If you had any kind of issues, it was sweep it under the rug, keep up yeah. appearances, don't talk about anything. And I don't know what your experience is with like healing generational trauma, but I feel like a lot of what we do with looking back at childhood, we're also healing generations of people suppressing things and not talking about any kind of mental issue that they may have had or 100%. attachment issue. My dad, he's the typical like narcissist and like cliche. That's why I'm like, I don't even talk about the people, oh, talk about narcissism. I'm not a therapist. Right? I, I only will with a licensed therapist because that's a personality disorder. Like there's clinical, you need to understand that versus just some, like if I see one more person, like every avoidance of narcissist, you're like, oh, shut up. But my father was cliche, like, won't talk about childhood, won't talk about anything. It's just, if you're sad, stop, just be happy. And you're like, oh, it's only that fucking easy. Is that all I have to do? Whereas my mom now, she even says to me, she's like, if it wasn't for you, I wouldn't be where I'm at. She started therapy. Because she also wanted to stop this shit. She was like, I'm tired of it. I'm tired of us reliving the same thing over and over and over again and feeling generational. And I think she and I are the first to like cut right into it, which means that a lot of people are not going to be cool with it. Because once you start setting boundaries and once you start trying to change things, it, you, you lose people out of your life. But those are the people that you shouldn't, they're not really healthy for you to begin with. Yeah. Setting boundaries is such a huge act of self-love and especially, I don't know if you relate to this, but being someone who's kind of struggled with anxiety, people pleasing coincides with that a lot. And yeah. when you start setting boundaries, that can feel so foreign and it can feel so polarizing. But if you don't set boundaries, that's how you let people walk all over you. And I think that's how you allow that pattern to continue from generation to generation of going for the same narcissistic traits and then it just continues. But if you decide to set the boundaries you're taking your power back in a way. 100%. And it's so like, and I talk about boundaries and non-negotiables all the time because get rid of your, like my brother, so he's also a dating coach and he always, his thing is burn the checklist. It's like, get rid of this fucking, oh, well, they're tall and they're athletic and they're handsome. It's like, no, the only list you should have are your boundaries and non-negotiables because guess what? That makes dating a lot easier for the people because you can see your radar is astute. You know, if my non-negotiables and my boundaries are, I need to have consistency, reciprocity, I want to feel seen, heard, and understood, then when you're dating, you go, I don't feel like this. I'm out. I don't care how you feel about the person I feel like. I care about how you feel when you're with them. Because I, you can romanticize somebody, but then you're like, yeah, but they treat me like shit. It's like, so then what do you love about them? I had a client that did that, but I loved him. I loved him. I said, the guy that ghosted you and broke your heart and left you and did all that, I'm like, you what, what what you're not seeing here is you overlooked a lot and what it like a lot of the time it's like you don't trust yourself anymore but boundaries help you so that you reaffirm the trust within yourself and that you feel more comfortable as you're out there that you're not going to have the wool pull over your eyes and you're not going to do the oh how am i going to know it's like you'll be your radar is going to be really astute your boundaries aren't to keep people out there to protect what's in and i think when people understand that it's like like even my boyfriend, he's so good at setting boundaries. It's, it's like a beautiful practice to see. When we first started dating, first thing he said to me when I was starting to do the texting thing was, let me clarify something really quick with you. This is not a sign of disinterest. I'm actually super fucking into you and I really like you, but I don't like to text. I stare at screens for nine hours of my day. I don't connect with people, but I'd love to see you. And this is a boundary I'm setting off the bat. And I was like, damn, respect. That's amazing. And he show, and it's like, had I been in that anxious, like, fuck this guy, and you're not texting me every day. It's like, he didn't, and he even said, he goes, it's not that I don't want to. And he was like, but I am making a conscious effort to not expedite our relationship faster than it needs to go and create this whole bullshit, false sense of intimacy that doesn't exist. And like this, this romanticizing of something. And sure enough, it's like, yeah, we've been together five months. Yeah, we talk every day because we're in a relationship now, but it built up over time 
versus having no boundaries, no non-negotiables, nothing, and being like, oh yeah, just dump all over me. And then you wonder why, because you're holding on to the idea of them or the potential of who they could be, and you're not actually seeing them for who they are. You said so many things I love in there. I love what you said about boundaries uh, being protecting what's what you're keeping in. I think that's such an empowering way to look at it. And also that trap of falling in love with the idea of somebody wow. is so deadly. And I wanted to talk with this uh, about what you said earlier on TikTok. You made a TikTok about how texting creates a false sense of intimacy. And that's a hot take. So can you kind of oh. elaborate on that a little bit? Yeah. So here's the thing. Ultimately, at the end of the day, I don't tell people what to do in their dating life. You do whatever you want. But there is something to be said of like, we've all been there. Once you get into your 30s and you're like, wait a minute, I've done this a million times. When you start to text somebody, you don't know who they are. So you are creating the tone of which they're speaking. You are creating the voice in which they're having. You are creating the vision of who they are based off some words on your phone. And people say, well, how do you get to know someone? You get to know somebody by spending time with them. So a lot of people will do the, oh, well, no, I have to text every day. And I don't get my text. And it's like, that is not, first of all, somebody texting you every day has nothing to do with the, them wanting a relationship with you. A lot of people text because they're bored. They're taking a shit. They have nothing better to do. They want to, they want to feel pretty. How many times I used to send a thirst trap to a guy just to feel better about myself when I was dealing with my low self-esteem. I don't want anything with this guy. And there's a fallacy on that same token of if somebody doesn't text you every single day when you start dating, that doesn't mean that you give up on them and you walk away. Because oftentimes you are you are romanticizing something that doesn't exist. And you'll get this all the time. Well, we text every day, all day for a month. We had a first date and then he ghosted me. I never heard from him. It's like, no, what he did was he met you and he got to know you. The reason I say omit all of the texting is just get to know the person by spending time with them then you progress because like my mom always says, when you go to hundred, where do you want to go? You can only go down. And a lot of people are chasing a feeling. If you're going to text everyone, good morning, good afternoon. Well, how's your day? What's going on? It's like, but you know, why would I let you in my life? I don't know you. And that's a boundary within me. I don't want to let somebody into my life that I don't trust yet. I don't know who this person is. I don't need to say, I don't need to have somebody that's filling up my day to give me a little quick dopamine, serotonin, hate of oh, they name because then your mood gets affected. You start to realize, and a lot of the times, the reason I say it's a false sense of intimacy, you don't actually fucking know this person. So you'll freak out and go, after three dates, I never heard from them again. It's like, yeah, you're acting as if you've been together with this person for seven months. You hung out with them three times. That's that's it. And if you did omit all the texting, you go, yeah, I guess I don't really know this person. Yeah. <laughs> it's funny because I think about uh, my dating life and how much time I've wasted Ugh. with those texting situationships before even meeting someone there's people that i've met on dating apps that i've texted for a month before meeting yeah. them and then it comes time to meet and they're like oh i'm sorry i'm not ready for this and then you get all upset because you same thing here i am we're texting every single day or we facetime we did this and that but it's like if you haven't met the person even when you've met the person let's say two times even three times you yeah. still don't know them you don't know them yeah and here's the thing, what i've learned is like a lot of people in our generation don't want to sit they don't want any discomfort and dating is very fucking uncomfortable. Oh, you yeah. have to learn to sit in your own shit and be like, okay, because it's always, I need the guarantee. I have so many people like, well, if you don't tell me that you want a relationship off the bat and all this, and it's like, just because someone says they want a relationship doesn't mean that they want one with you. They could, you could have the same intentions. That is dating. Dating is to get to know somebody to see, do I want to check, cash the check that I'm writing right now? And that's what it, it's like. And the reason I say it, I don't say stop with the texting shit, no games. It has nothing to do with like playing hard to get or being, about, no, if you struggle with anxiety and this isn't working for you and you get fucking head over heels on somebody, that is why I say it. it's for anxiety management. And so that you can actually get to know who this person is versus the idea of them. And then all of a sudden, this is why you think people get so get divorced after a year. Because you rushed in and you chased a feeling. But the thing is that feeling grows over time because you have to build trust with somebody, intimacy and a connection with them. That takes time. You can't expedite that. It's not a fucking rom-com. Movies are built out of exposition. It makes sense to build all of these things. Real life doesn't have that. Yeah. Wow. That's so true. It's interesting, too, because when I think about what you're saying about texting so much early on, it's not sustainable long term. No. I don't know anyone unless you have all the time in the world. I don't want someone texting me 24 seven. That's not sustainable long term. And if you want a relationship with someone a year down the line, do you want them to be texting you? Good morning. How are you doing? What, what are you having for lunch every single day? That's not a sustainable pattern. And I think a lot of people get 
kind of upset where, and you've spoken about this too in some of your videos, where if you've been seeing someone for a few months and the communication style changes, right? You've kind of settled into a rhythm that that's where a lot of us who have this anxious attachment style start to get that oh shit feeling of like, yeah. are they not interested in me anymore because they're, they're not texting me as much. And I'm saying this to call myself out. I've been in this yeah. position before so many times of like when that communication pattern starts changing, that anxiety starts creeping up. So what advice would you have to someone who is maybe seeing someone and they're starting to notice that shift, but they're not quite sure what to make of it? I mean, I think there's a few things. It's like, it depends on where that person is. If they're just regulated, if it's like constant anxiety, first step is, is, is regulation. I always compare it as like, imagine if someone was gonna jump off the cliff. You can't talk reason until you pull them off the ledge and get them on solid ground to then start being able to have it. They're not here with you. And so it's the same brain. When we go into anxious brain and we start to ruminate, you are leaving the front, the, the cortex. And when you leave your front cortex, that is decision-making. That is, that is where you can be able to understand and rationalize. So it's first about self-regulation. Then once you're regulated and you're like, let's go for a walk. If you do jumping jacks, you can punch a pillow. I don't care. A anxiety is energy. It's just about breaking that up. Once you get back onto that even ground, it's truly about challenging your thoughts. Because I think what a lot of people don't understand is a couple of things. I've talked to many, many, many of guys. True, secure men don't want to text you all the time. They don't. They say, I, most of the guys I know, they're like, I do it because I know the girl wants to, but I don't really want to do that. And so it's like, even that, that's compromise. They're making compromises on your end to try to meet you halfway. Second of all, you can't expect somebody else to validate every experience that you have. Your partner isn't there for you to do that. So some people are like, I can't sit more than six hours if my partner doesn't text me. It's like, go live your fucking life, dude. You, your emotions can't be controlled by somebody else. So it's really challenging those thoughts and also trying to find facts to back this up. Because what also people don't understand is, when you see something, let's say your boyfriend didn't answer or the guy you're dating didn't answer for you. Hey, guess what? He could have a work meeting that day. Maybe it's a different schedule. You start going into anxious brain. You create a scenario that doesn't exist. You act differently towards him. Then the guy's going, I don't say, what happened to that girl? She's super cool. Now all of a sudden she's freaking out on me because I didn't answer her. I was busy. Then all of a sudden, why do you think the breakdown in communication starts to happen? Because the one person's projecting their bullshit onto the other person. The other person's going, whoa, whoa, whoa. What's going on? And then you start to divide. And then that other person goes, all right, I need to take a step back. I think she's getting a little much. People don't realize that when you have that anxiety, you act on it. The other person can feel it. And if it hasn't yeah. been a long time and that person doesn't know you or they haven't experienced anything with you, that person could be really healthy going, this is not the behavior I want. And then it starts to spiral. Not to, again, not to write off bad behavior. Somebody is like, if you see a blatant shift in behavior, Okay, so yeah, have a conversation with that person. Yeah. But if it's just like a one-time thing, challenge your thoughts. Where are the facts to back this up? He hasn't texted me. Not enough of a fact. Okay, yeah, that's right. He's given me no other reason to think this. Okay, where is this stemming from? Yeah, as a kid, my dad would be really inconsistent, and that it's making me feel triggered, and I'm feeling triggered because I feel like this guy's abandoning me. And when I didn't hear from him, it made it. you start to call yourself out on your shit. And then you can also share this with your partner if you guys are close enough. You've been dating for two or three months. I share that with my boyfriend all the time. I'll be like, you know, hey, when you said this, I got really triggered. And it made me feel like you didn't actually care about me and that you were trying to find an excuse not to be with me. Am I picking, am I correct on that? I didn't accuse him. I took full ownership and I came with power and confidence to say, hey, if there's something you want to talk about, let's talk about it. But if somebody tells you, no, I was just at work and doing something, you've got to trust them. If you don't trust yeah. your partner, then what the fuck are you doing? Mm -hmm. I think it's so important and kind of goes back to something we were talking about earlier is having the courage to have some of these uncomfortable conversations is so healthy and not suppressing things and something we can get into that I know if anyone out there that's listening that struggles with anxiety, the what are we talk is probably the most anxiety inducing thing. Oh my God, for me, it grinds my gears. Nobody wants to have it. What are your thoughts on approaching that? Do you think that women should be approaching that first? Do you think the man should be saying that first? What are your thoughts on the whole what are we thing? I oh, so it's a couple of things. And I think what are we comes from an insecure place of you tell, you validate to me what we're experiencing versus coming from a place of power. You don't ask them, you do the reveal. My favorite comedian, Jared Frieda, always talks about this. And he's like, no, 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 no. You go and you say, hey, I really enjoy getting to know you. I'm having a good time. I don't want to date anyone else. That's it. Then you allow them to go, me too. Yeah, I'm, I'm really enjoying this. Or, hey, I'm not there yet. Okay, let's talk about it. Then you open up the dialogue. Well, what are your intentions? Because you're my intentions. And I just want to make sure we align. 
And I think it's it's less about waiting for the other person to give you permission and more about you, because here's the thing with the reveal. You, when you do the, what are we? You are using it as a cop out to that if they say nothing, you go, oh my God, yeah, me too, totally. Yeah, yeah, no, I'm good. But when you know that if you share what you want and if it doesn't align with them, the shit will get off the pot. It's at that moment of, yeah. okay, then do we continue this? Because I want a relationship and you don't. That's to me how situationships get started. There's a breakdown in communication. One person is too scared to truly say what they're saying, what they would want, yeah. because they know that the other person could walk away. And to them, having a little piece of them is better than having nothing. But what you don't realize is that starts to eat away because you self abandon. And when you self abandon your needs for somebody else, you are never going to be fulfilled. You're constantly going to be waiting for their cues, and you're not living authentically in your own truth. Yeah. And you're also cutting yourself off from somebody who could potentially be giving you everything that you want too, all the, the time that you're wasting allow- with that person. Yeah. 100%. I'm sorry to cut you off. The more you nope. allow somebody wrong in your life is the less time you allow the right person into your life. Yeah. I think it, it's interesting about, um, I like your stance on the reveal. I think that's really helpful for anybody that's kind of like putting that other person on a pedestal, which we shouldn't be putting the other person no. on a pedestal. And I think it goes both ways too. And, and something that I've learned is with ghosting, with stopping with the ghosting. Like I've, yeah. I've really grown to learn the power of saying no and also just yeah. speaking up of like, hey, really nice to meet you. I just didn't really feel a connection. And because just think about what kind of a position that puts someone in. You don't owe anyone anything, but at the same time, ghosting's a shitty move. I don't I don't really think there's any other way to put it. Like you could at the very least tell someone, hey, I'm not feeling it and move on. Because I know for me oh. that if somebody wasn't interested in me, I would so much rather them tell me to my face, hey, I'm not interested in you, than for me to sit here for two weeks, three weeks, whatever, however much time it is, and wonder, oh, could I have done this differently? What about this? And that's when it sends you down that spiral of back to what you said earlier, those scenarios that you create in your head when there's that unknown space of like, oh, well, could this potentially happen? And then you connect all of this energy and emotion to that potential. And then people feel that. Yeah. Energy is no. real. People feel that. Listen, I'm with you. I'm not, I don't condone ghosting. I think it's the most cowardice, bullshit move. Like, I don't. But there's a couple of things here. I'll, I'll follow up the but. There's an understanding of what ghosting actually is. I get this all the time. The guy ghosted me, and then he came back three days later. And then he ghosted me again. I'm like, no, 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 no. That guy is just being inconsistent with his communication. That's not ghosting. Or we had one date, and he ghosted me. No, he didn't want to see you again. That's part of dating. Ghosting is, yeah, we've been dating for a month whatever we have plans or i just straight up never heard from this person again not we had one or two dates and then they didn't want to continue so i think there's an understanding of what ghosting actually is so you can identify correctly and then on top of it the thing about ghosting is it has nothing to do with you and it has to do with them i'm not saying that maybe they want to break up with you for a valid reason that's yeah but ghosting specifically doesn't say anything about you. What that says about the other person, they have a fear of confrontation. They can't be honest and communicative. To them, it's, oh, they'll just get the point. Do you show how, do you see how emotionally immature and limited the other person is? Because a lot of the times we want to take ownership and onus of it's my fault and I did it when, because it's easier to do that because you have control over that versus having to accept. I have no control over the fact that that person did it and I can't control anything that has to do with this. Yeah, it's true. It's to me, it is a very immature response. And like you said, it for me, ghosting isn't what you said about, oh, they were gone for three days and then they came back. Ghosting is when like MIA, they've fallen off the face of the earth. And I've had that happen plenty of times. And I think anybody who's participated in dating culture in this day and age has experienced it at one point or another. And yeah, it just seems really immature. I just feel like a lot of people out there would feel better if I know people in my life that will ghost people and I've heard them yeah. say, and I'm like, well, why don't you just say, Hey, I'm not feeling it. And they're like, Oh, well, it's just easier for me. Like she'll, she'll get the hint. Yeah. And I just feel like that's perpetuating a cycle of this an- anxiety that a lot of us feel because the more that we're ghosted, then we carry that into the next person that we see. And it's just an and ongoing thing. Said about that too. Like I used to get ghosted when I was in my shittier days, but like, as I started to heal and do the work, I wasn't getting ghosted because I wasn't wasting my time on somebody who was so emotionally immature and not at that big. I wouldn't give them the time to ghost me. Like when somebody is going to ghost, that says a lot about them. Not to say I'm not going to victim blame. Listen, you got ghosted. This isn't your fault. It's not like, oh, you did anything. I'm just saying the radar starts to get picked up where you're like, no, 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 that person. You start to look back and look at the person who ghosted you and you're like, 
yeah, I could see I overlooked that, or I felt that was okay, and it's not that behavior. It's more of use it as a lesson of what are what are the things I overlooked here, and sometimes there's nothing. Sometimes somebody really is amazing at that, and I'm not. I like I said, I never. I'm not blaming other people, but what I want to do is I want people to start understanding you. As if you make sure your side of the street is clean, then you have a lot less anxiety and you have a lot less of that because you know that you are doing right. That is that is dating with detachment. You can't control the other person, nor can you control the outcome. But what I can control is myself. So if I know that I'm the best version of myself, I've done all the work on myself that I can to this point and I can continue going on, and that I am as astute and aware as I can be, great, I'm doing the best I can with the information I've given. And as a, if, I, if, you, if you consistently keep getting ghosted, if it's guy after guy after guy, that is where it's like, great, well, let's look at something. There has to be a common denominator. What is that? Is it that the guy doesn't feel he can express himself because some girls will go fucking bananas? Mm -hmm. Is it because maybe he showed you this behavior early on and you missed it? Is it because he was too, you know what I mean? It's just, yeah. if it's a consistent pattern in your life, let's look at it is all I'm saying. Yeah, I think that's fair. And, and if you have experienced it, you know, once or twice, doesn't mean there's something wrong with you. As you no. said, if that says everything about the other person's totally. style of communication. But if, it, if something is a pattern, I always like to think, the pattern will keep repeating until the lesson is learned, whatever it is. And I've learned this to be true in my life, uh, especially with dating. So it's like, what can you sit back and learn from it? And something else I want to uh, say too, and I'm sure you'll agree with this, a perspective I used to have with dating was, oh, well, I hope this other person likes me. I really hope that, mm -hmm. that they were feeling my vibe and that they thought I was pretty. But now when I go into a dating scenario, I think, do I like this person? Is this someone that I could see myself with? And that's a huge perspective shift for a lot of people. If you've been in that old mindset, you'll know how much of a shift that is to say, yeah. oh, I'm thinking about what I'm actually looking for in my needs rather than putting this other person on a pedestal and having my entire life revolve around if they're sending me a text or not. It's a huge 100%. shift to make. 100%. It's like, of course, you know, you're keeping, look, I'm with you 100%. It was the same. I, I left dates instead of, oh, do they like me? Because you're like, wait, but do you even like them? Or do you like the idea of them? Or when you yeah. really peel it back, and I think a lot of people are, are scared to be honest with themselves because then they have to realize, oh, all right, this one didn't work. You know, like, and so some people, yeah. oh, no, like I, like I had one client and she was like, no, 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 but he had money. And it's like, so you're holding on to one aspect because you don't want to, and oh, because I'm in my thirties and it's kind of like, there it is. There's scarcity mindset that starts to play in. And then you start to believe that there's not enough. And so you'll hold on to anything. And again, my grandma Lucy always said, better to be alone than in bad company. I'd rather be alone, home, watching my shitty fucking reality TV shows and eating whatever I want than dealing with somebody where I feel completely unfulfilled and more alone even when I'm with them. Yes. Oh, amen to all of that. I think about this all the time of the the scarcity mindset when it comes to dating of people that are, I don't know, I don't want to use the word settling. I don't, I don't want to say that, but yeah. overlooking deal breakers or yeah. things that really should matter. Like for me, for example, I, I don't drink alcohol. So that's a big deal to me is like, I don't mind if someone drinks, but he could be the hottest guy in the world. But if somebody's out till 3am every weekend getting blackout, that will never work for me. But if you come at it from a scarcity mindset, you might say, oh, well, he has this, he has that, mm -hmm. and he's got this. So I'll just I'll just overlook that because like this should fit the puzzle piece that I'm trying to put it in. 100%. And I think a lot of people get caught in that trap where it's actually more empowering to wait. It's not to say don't write off every other person because I really don't – nobody's perfect, right? Yeah. But there's somebody out there for you if you give yourself some time and space rather than to try to force something to fit if you feel like pressure from society or pressure from your family or even pressure from yourself that you like have to be in a relationship or you have to find someone. Totally. Like Jay Shetty always says, like, I love, I loved all that you said. Cause like you said, you know, you don't, you don't find a relationship that's perfect. You build one, you grow one together, you create one. Like my boyfriend and I, we don't have a perfect relationship by any means. Who does? We've got a lot of stuff that we kinks that we work around. But we both, the key word is every time an issue comes up, he says, I want to do this because I want to be with you. I want to be, I want to grow with you. And that's what it's about. It's about finding somebody that's like, I'm, I want to listen to you. Your, your shit matters to me. I want to do better. Thank you for calling me out. Not, oh, it's just going to be a perfect bow. And that's kind of go back, so that goes back to my texting thing of like, just because maybe a guy might not want to text you every single day, but he's asking you on dates consistently. He calls you once a week. It's like, Stop looking at the one thing he doesn't have because you miss out on somebody truly beautiful that you could grow with. That might, and then as you get to know them, you can share, hey, 
I would feel really good if you text me a little bit more. If the guy wants to be in a relationship with you, he'll go, okay, I could do that. There's a need, there's a desire, they, there's a, a genuine interest in being there. That's not very different than if you wanted to be would. I hate that saying. That's not what I'm saying. But if somebody has a genuine desire for it, they'll show up for you. Yeah, it's kind of that, I know this phrase is so tossed around, but if he wanted to, he would, right? Well, so that's actually my least favorite saying. Because really? I'll say okay. Because I'll say it because what it does is it lacks a lot of compassion for things. There is a certain amount of element. Listen, I think it's a, a, applicable for the first you know, week of dating. Like, listen, if the guy wanted to fucking call you, he'll call you. Like, that's what that's where I'm like, yes. Where I think it gets dicey is, you know, you're in a relationship or you're like, you want a relationship and they don't. Well, if he really wanted to, he would. It's like some people are dealing with like immense emotional shit mental health issues like my brother he was honest he was like i've met incredible matches in my life and he was like i was not financially in a place and i was super insecure and i didn't think that it was right when he was like it's not that i didn't want to there's a lot of things i want to do in life but i wasn't there to allow that person and receive them and that's where i think it's like i i get that it's a blanketed statement so it's like it's easy to use but i think it 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 discredits the person because it's like it has nothing to do with maybe he does want you but he doesn't know how to like my brother says, if you're dating somebody and they only know how to get this shallow in the pool, but you want to go deep here, they don't know how to swim. It's not that he doesn't want to know how to swim. Yeah. He can't. And so if he doesn't have the bandwidth or the opportunity, like my favorite therapist, uh, Therapy Jeff, he said it beautifully. He's like, it's not if he wanted to, he would. It's if he had the bandwidth, he would. Mm, that's powerful. The understanding, he would. And there's a lot of people, look at it. It's the same. I could say the same thing to you. Well, if you really didn't want to be anxious anymore, you wouldn't. And it's like, oh, how? Yeah. there's no compassion there to understand the work that's involved in getting to a field space to allow that. Yeah. And it also doesn't mean there's anything wrong with you either. Like I've experienced rejection before mm -hmm. and it's easy to get caught in that trap of once you feel that, that pain of yeah. thinking there's something wrong with you. I'm the yeah. problem. I'm not good enough. I'm not worthy enough. But if you zoom out, you don't really know, especially if you've only dated someone for a few months, you don't really know the extent of what they're going through. Like you said, totally. you don't know the extent of their trauma, their emotional baggage, where they're at. And you shouldn't have to let that um, negate your self-worth. You know, yes, and that's a trap that I, I, I'm still working through all this stuff too. For anyone listening, totally. I don't have all the answers. I am not healed. I'm not all fixed. Okay. Like we are a work in progress over here, but yeah. it's just the gaining awareness of your own tendencies in this way, I think is so powerful. And I think for anyone listening to this, maybe there's people who are more on the avoidance side too. Totally. Think about it. How do, how do you show up in yes. that setting and kind of like take a mental note of it and think about your past relationships. Think about people that you've dated in the past. Do you have a pattern? For me, it was the pattern of waiting for the texts. And if I don't get them, I feel that anxiety in my gut. I'm super nervous. I can't focus on anything. So it's like, okay, what can I do to understand that that's where I'm coming from, but to also move past it and give myself grace so that the next person that I date, I'm not pushing away because I'm so anxious because they haven't texted me for like six hours. A hundred percent. It's like the awareness around, well, yeah, what's my part in this? And I think a lot, it's a lot of the, no blame ever, but like one girl, she's like, you always victim blame. You don't hold accountable the men that, that treat us poorly. And I'm like, oh, no, but again, that goes back to you, babe. You allow it. That, that actually is about you. It's stop blaming everybody else because the more you blame external circumstances, the less it, you're taking any ownership and realizing your part. You are a badass babe who has every right to demand what she wants in her life from a partner, but you also have to show up as that. And it's not just everybody else, everybody else. That's not a partnership then. There's also that you have to take accountability. I think a lot of people, you think you want, you, you think you know what you want and then you'll get it and you're like, nah, that's not, and it's like, yeah, well. And I have, cause I have a clothing line that's called software. And I've learned that over the years when I used to ask like clients, oh, what do you guys want to see here? I would do polls on Insta and then everybody would choose one color and then we didn't sell any. And you're like, you think you know what you want, yeah. but you don't. Cause I give it to you and then you still don't want it. Sounds shiny, but it's hard to receive that. And I think it's 100% like you said, show yourself some grace. I'm not healed. No one is fucking perfect. No one is healed. I'm 32, I'm 33 in May. I have 30 plus years I had to undo. It doesn't just take a couple of years for that to happen, but I, I, I'm a work in progress. And I will always say, about, I still get triggered. I still feel anxiety, but I don't let it consume me any longer. And I know I'm on my healing journey and growth pattern because I changed the way I no longer react, I respond. Because I'm not reacting from the seven-year-old that's begging them to see everybody as my father and everyone as a threat. I'm responding from the 32-year-old woman that knows better and has reparented the little child to say, it's okay, I fucking got this. Yeah, wow. 
That's so powerful. I love, I love what you said about healing the inner child. And I think for a lot of us with all of this stuff, like something that I want to point out is healing is important and don't get it twisted with suppressing the anxiety. Cause I think some people will just assume, Oh, well, let me just pretend it's not there. Like you joked earlier, you're like, Oh, Oh, your anxiety, just like stop feeling it and you're good. Don't, it's not to get it twisted with that of just suppressing it and pushing it under the rug. It's actually the opposite of facing it head on because you will not break this pattern until you figure your shit out. Nothing changes if nothing changes. Yeah. Simply put. It's like, if you're not going to do any work to change, then don't expect your dating life to change. Yeah. It's not just, oh, okay, well, I'll just go on less dates or I'll just date. No, no. If you don't do the shit that you need to do for yourself, if you are the common denominator, like one person said, oh, it's because I'm not good enough. And I was like, no, it's your mindset that's coming in the way. She said, well, I'm the common denominator. I said, yeah, you are. But let's talk about your mindset, the way that you're approaching them, the way what your expectations are has nothing to do with you. You are, of course, you're good enough. I said, but you're stopping yourself from allowing that. That is the common denominator. Yeah, it's true. And I think sometimes, too, with something you said earlier, with people that get ghosted time and time again, that pattern is still showing up for them. So it's like, what, what is, what am I doing in this for this to keep happening to me? And it doesn't mean that there's anything wrong with you. It might mean raising your standards a little bit to that. Not like the checklist of like, oh, he needs to have a six pack and he needs to be over six feet tall. What is the checklist? Like you said, of those deal breaker things for you that are going to make you feel safe and secure in a relationship. And the less that you allow in, it's not to say to be super picky with dating, but I do think that you should have some kind of system in place and you can, uh, I'd like to hear your input on this, but I think you should have some kind of internal system where you're on your first few dates where you're saying, okay, is this person meeting my internal need? Like for me, for example, the drinking thing is a huge thing for me. So I'm always thinking for myself, is this person someone that's going to want to party every weekend? If they are cool, I'm going to go my separate way. If not, I don't care if they have a few drinks, but I kind of want to see where this goes. What are your thoughts on going into a date with kind of like an internal vetting system to put it sterilely? <laughs> No, totally. I think that's, that's your walking in with your non-negotiables. Like I'm with you. I'm the same with the drinking. I'm like, I don't drink. I don't, par- I don't party. It's just, I don't like it. I don't like the yeah. taste of it. So why would I go to a bar and meet somebody when that's not the lifestyle I want? Why would I put my, that's not, that's not compatibility. Yeah. And that's the difference. I can have an insane chemistry with that person. Mm-hmm. But I might not be compatible to grow a fucking life with them. There's a very big difference. So I think when you're dating, the only list I want you to have is your non-negotiables and boundaries list, because that is taking care of you. So what are your non-negotiables? I don't want to do that likes to party or drink excessively. You have every right to say that doesn't work for me. You're not judging anybody. But so when you go at it, the guy, for instance, you match on a dating app without those non-negotiables, the guy goes, let's get a drink. They're like, oh, I don't want to. But if, and if, he, if you're like, oh, well, let's go do this. No, I want to get a drink. But when you have the non-negotiables, hey, I don't drink, so that doesn't work for me. If the person doesn't, result, great, thanks. I just spared myself. Yeah. Start that in the beginning. I don't want to do, like my boyfriend, he's like, want to get a drink? I said, no, I want to go, I, I don't drink. It's like, oh, let's go on a hike. We went on a hike. He can yeah. drink anytime he wants. And he even said, he was like, I'm so glad you don't. It's a great, it's a, it's a great influence on me. He's like, I don't need to drink. And he was like, it's helping my performance. I'm more athletic, yada, yada. Great. But when he wants a beer, go the fuck have one. But it was a non-negotiable for me because I did. I dated a guy that was an alcoholic. Yeah. And that didn't work for me because I didn't say anything. Everything was him. let's go get drinks. And I wouldn't say anything. Yeah. I think a big part of it is speaking up for yourself too. It, recognizing it's a two-way street. Like anyone who's been in this anxious mindset and you get in that habit of putting the other person on the pedestal, it's like, oh, what do they want to do for the date? Or let me let them take the lead or let me make sure I'm doing this for them. It's like, you can speak up for yourself too. Yeah. If you don't want to go, I've done that many times. I've said, hey, I don't drink. Let's go for a coffee instead or something. And then they'll be like, oh, cool. Or if they don't answer me, then fine. Yeah, here's the thing. You Moving can't be to lose somebody if you didn't have them. Yeah. So like even the same of like, oh, if I speak up and what if he leaves me? It's like, then you didn't have him. You're, you did you're yourself a, a favor. Right. You're now in a false reality. I don't know where you are. But if you think that, oh, he just has to get to know me and he'll fall in love with me. It's like, again, it's not a fucking rom-com. We are in real life here. So I, I find it, you, you want to attract the right partner. Because I don't really believe in like, like, you know, I've had that where it's like, what are you doing to attract them? I'm like, I don't know. I'm just fucking being. But to me, it's what do you, you want to allow the right partner into your life? Great. Then have your, then be very clear on what it is that you want and express that. Guys, men find that sexy. Boys find that unattractive. Boom. (laughs) Same shit. It's like women find that really attractive of a man. A girl wants the games, wants the chasing, wants the bullshit. 
Very big fucking difference. You want a man? Then start acting like a woman, and that way you allow a man into your life. Yeah. Do away with the games. Games, Ugh. to me... And I hate when I see some of these people on TikTok, I don't know if you've seen them too, where it's like, this is how long you should wait to send a text. Yes. And if you want dark psychology tricks to make a guy fall in love with you, it's like, can we just stop? No, you're teaching them how to be fucking avoidant. You're teaching yeah. them how to, how, to, how to play into it. It's the same as my brother and I were looking, and it's a lot of this definitive. If a guy does this, that means he loves yes. you. It's like, yeah. I'm sorry, one dude was, if a guy kisses you on the forehead, that means he wants you as a girlfriend. And I was like, I'm sorry, what la la are you living on right now? And that's where it's like, I don't do that shit. I'll, yeah. Sometimes I'll say, if a guy likes you, it's like, yeah, equity equals interest. He'll show up for yeah. you. No shit. But it's none of this. It's not, there is no black and white. And it's the same thing with the texting stuff. When I talk about that, it's not, if you do this, it's 100% that. Listen, can anything happen? Is it, you want to go and do what you want to do, but you have to be a big girl that you're writing a check that you have to be ready to cash. So if you want to go through the intestinal test, you want to live that life, then don't come back crying after when you're completely devastated. And I'm going to go, yeah. Well, that's what we're talking about. Yeah. So in hearing you say that, I have a question. How would you or what advice would you give to somebody who is anxious attachment going into, let's say, meeting someone off of a dating app and there's that like initial texting phase to set up a few dates? What advice would you give to somebody so that they can protect their energy and kind of protect themselves from really falling into that attachment slope? Totally. Set a boundary. Boundaries for anxious attachment are really tough because they know that it keeps people out and thus it, feel, it feels like rejection. They take it very personally and it's not. Set the boundary. Hey, I think you're really cool. Um, I would love to get together. Here's my number or whatever. If you don't want to give your number, uh, you can FaceTime, whatever, like whatever your comfort level is, get to it. You exchange some messages. Okay, we have the rapport. It's fun. You're enjoying it. They're being communicative. You don't need to talk for fucking six weeks before you meet this person. And if you're saying, hey, I want to have a FaceTime, vibe check. I want to make sure you're the real person. Cool. You can do that on the app. You don't even need to give your fucking phone number. And it's like, depending on this, the comfort level. But if you're messaging with someone and you're like, I don't want to get into this spiral, set a boundary. Hey, I'm really excited to meet you. I would love to get this going and get off the app. Let me know your availability. Put it out there. Because the guy might be like, fuck yeah, I'm so in. Let's do this. And if he doesn't, and he just wants to keep texting, hey, really not looking for a pen pal. I'd yeah. rather get to know you in person. Let me know when you're available. If they still do, that's it. Goodbye. Cut them off. Be yeah. okay to walk away. Because if you think, oh, if we just text every day, he's going to want it. Nah, stop playing into if it ha baby, if you are the definition of insanity. If it hasn't worked already, then yeah. what makes you think it's going to work right now? Yeah. I think we've all been there. Like, I've certainly been there. But oh, I will say... Yeah. Um, at least in my experience, the FaceTime date or FaceTime kind of call has helped me weed out a lot of people that are no bueno for me. 100%. And it doesn't have to be long. It can only be like 20 minutes. You can yeah. get a really good vibe check and then you don't have to waste your time texting someone for six weeks, like you said, or going out to meet them if you've already done that initial chat. And in my opinion, if they're not willing to do that FaceTime, I've had a few people that have said, oh, I don't want to do that. I'm not comfortable on the phone or on the video. Then I'm like, bye. I don't. Come on. Yeah, it's like it's a comfort level. Like I, and it, and then there's also the reality too that just because you have a vibe check and go out doesn't mean like I had a friend. She did that. She met this guy in Hinge. They had a FaceTime. She's like, yeah, he's really cool. I'm excited. She went out and she didn't like him. She yeah, was nice, but she's like, I didn't feel, I didn't feel what I wanted to feel. And like he and she was like, we're very different. We're not compatible. And he, she told him honestly, and he was, and she said, hey, I bet you were really awesome. Glad we got to do this, but I didn't feel a connection. And he was like, thanks, thanks for telling me. That is welcome to a dating. And here's yeah. the thing, a date doesn't mean commitment. It just means that you are going to have to see this person if you want to see them again. A FaceTime doesn't mean, okay, they want you as their girlfriend. It just means that they're like, no. all right, let's meet in person. See what we have in person. Chemistry could be off. Guess what? You can get to know somebody. You can scratch the surface. The waiter says something and you see they're rude and you're like, what the fuck was mm. that? That you didn't see on a FaceTime. You didn't see in text messages. Yeah. It's funny you say that because I actually had a really similar experience where I did the FaceTime thing. I was like, oh, this guy's going to be great. We had a, a date and it was so bad. Like the chemistry was not there at all. It was just, it was like pulling teeth, trying to make conversation. And I messaged him afterwards. I'm like, Hey, you're really nice. Wasn't feeling this at all. And he said, same here. Wish you the best of luck. Moving on. It's, you got it. It's trial and error and you have to put yourself out there. Don't let your fear of the whole thing keep you from even trying. I think that's a trap some people get into is they think, Oh, I'm just going to give up altogether because this yeah. is just too much for me. And just remember too, it's a lot less personal than you think it is. Everybody is the star of their own movie and everyone else is an extra. So what makes you think you're also the fucking star of theirs? You're just another extra that's coming into play. Just like you, when you went out, it wasn't a personal thing against him. You're just like, yeah, I can feel it. Yeah. 
same with him. It doesn't mean, oh, I'm not good enough. I'm not with That's the work. If you always yeah. default back to there, that's the work. Because when you're in a healthier mind space, you understand rejection is part of it. I can't be for everybody. That would not be normal. That wouldn't be. Also, a, you'd I be people pleasing if you were for everyone. You wouldn't be authentic. Right? Exactly. Yeah. So this has been awesome. Um, I've loved everything you've said. I agree with everything you said so much. Um, do you have any last minute advice that you would give to anyone listening to this? I would just say, don't be scared about the journey of finding yourself. Like it's the most beautiful journey, reconnecting with the little inner you. I know it sounds really daunting. Like go to therapy if you feel like that's what you need. Like start somewhere and just know it's progress, not perfection. It's not going to happen overnight. You're not going to wake up and have this come to Jesus moment and be like, that's it, I'm healed. You're also not going to have one therapy session and be like, oh my God, that's it. It takes time. But just like anything working in life, it takes time. You can't, it's the same with the relationship, building a business. Could it happen? Are there the people that go viral overnight? Yeah. Are there the people that meet and then they're the love of their life and they run off into the sunset? Yeah. Don't bank on it. Manage your expectations and know it's, it's going to take you time to get there, but enjoy the process of doing it. I love that. It's a never ending journey. It's like you said, there's never a moment where we wake up and we're like, I'm healed. I'm awake. I'm no, enlightened. Like I got it all figured out. It's no. I compare it to going to the gym. I could give you, a, you if you're overweight or you're heavy or you're not in the body mind that you want, whatever it is, you're saying, I want a six pack and I want a big butt. I can give you everything you need. You got to go every fucking day. You got to eat the right food. You've got to be doing the right stuff. And you don't ever get to a point where you go, okay, I'm good now. No, you're always working. You're always, I could still be at the right now. I'm at the gym and I'm like, I'm happy with what I have. I want to keep going. I want to get better and better and better. That's the journey. There is no, like you said, there's no, whoop, that's it. It's, you're always a work in progress. And that I think is the most beautiful part because you can just keep exploring and you just never know where it's going to take you. Yeah. In any area of your life, fitness goals, yeah. business goals, your attachment styles, you're never going to have a place where you've got it fully figured out. I certainly don't. I always say to people, I don't even know what I don't know. Like there's so much still about myself and the world that I still don't know. And it's yeah. a part of the ride, man. That's life. I'm here with you, dude. I'm yeah. still I'm so glad we got to connect. And I'm yes. hopeful that people got some valuable information that they can use. Yeah. Thank you so much for coming on. Do you want to go ahead and plug your, your platforms, anything you got going on? Sure. Yeah. You can find me on TikTok at Sabrina.Zohar. Instagram, same thing. I have my own podcast called Do The Work. And if you want to like, learn more about what doing the work means, I would go take a listen. And uh, yeah, if anybody ever needs me, you could book a one-on-one -on -one session. You could ask me a question. We can chat. So just know that you are not alone in this journey and that there are other people here supporting you. Yeah. I love that. I'll leave all of her links in the description, guys. You can go ahead and check out her stuff. Uh, Sabrina, thank you again for coming on. This was awesome. I really, really enjoyed this. Awesome, dude. Thank you so much for having me. Yeah.